<laughs> I need to raise up. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? It looks blurry in that corner. I don't know why. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> Evening all. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers with your beers, everybody. I like the way Kate is so obedient already. I hope you're backstage, boss. Well, and I hear you're drinking different beer, but welcome. It's Swindon Founders, but it's not Swindon Founders. For number one, it's Thursday evening. This is confusing. We've got beer. That's not confusing. And a massive, we have to start this off, actually, with a massive thank you to the organisational genius that is Anita at the Business Exchange for getting us all a beer in one piece Cheers, on everyone. time. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Lucy. Cheers, Imogen. So the ladies and Rod, obviously, that's fine. How many have you had? What? That much? She's so it's rude. A tiny bit. I think she might know me too well. It's probably the problem, isn't it? Chain. Cheers. Excellent. Well, it's we... great to see so many of you in the room. Uh, Are we just going to sit here and drink for two hours now, Anita? Do we actually have to say stuff? I think we do, unfortunately. I think we <sighs> expect us to say something. Rubbish. <laughs> not like they've paid for this or anything. <laughs> so. Well, we've actually made lots of money, um, £80 for Yay. Great Western Hospital's COVID-19 staff. But whatever they're going to do, they need to have some fun at the end of this, that's for sure. So uh, we'll make sure that gets in their bank account. And thank you for sending that up, Anita. That was absolutely brilliant. So uh, let me do my official housekeeping. We'll, 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 we'll be serious now, I promise. Otherwise, Kate will tell me off again. Uh, uh, welcome to a very special uh, summer social. We wish we could do this in person. Um, but Anita and I had this idea of if we can't be with you, let's have beers and let's celebrate and let's have a bit of fun this evening. So this is a Take Swindon, The Techies summer mashup. And it would have a rude word tonight, but we don't use that word in Swindon. We're far too polite. So we're going to talk about failures, not the other word you're thinking of that begins with F. Um, and we're going to be um, sharing stories. So I want everybody to be uh, telling their, their woes of being a founder. And we have two, uh, two gentlemen joining us who have meant much experience of uh, working with founders and, and helping them through some of their woes. And the key themes are going to be time, money and people. But a bit of housekeeping because it's quite... An, a special time as well for Tech Swindon. We are just over a year old. It was a year ago that we all stood in nationwide back when we could do things in real life. Woo! And uh, I know, yeah, ages ago. And it was announced that uh, Switch On to Swindon had a new initiative called Tech Swindon to celebrate um, the fantastic tech community we had in the town. And, and I was brought on board not being able to find any of that. I mean, obviously, that means that we definitely were needed. And the more in my role I've been exploring over the last year, the more great companies I've found from from one man bands, from from um, the side hustle through to, you know, the big corporates. We have thousands of people employed in tech in Swindon. It's a really well kept secret. And my job is to let the world know about that. And actually, we started very quietly getting to know everybody. Our website launched in February and lockdown has been really good for Tech Swindon in a weird way. Uh, we went virtual with our events. We've had national coverage. We've had over 750 attendees on the Swindon Founders in real life and virtual events, which is amazing. And we started getting momentum. It really feels like we're, we're building something that's going going forward. So today, for example, is sponsored by Set Squared, who came on board as, as a, a supporter of the, the um, campaign a couple of weeks ago, joining Roy Twitty King, one of our, our founder supporters who uh, have supported all the Swindon founders from the very beginning. So thank you very much. I know Kevin's on the call today. And he's also bought me a book, which is going to be helping uh, with our sessions today. And we also have a hot off the press new supporter uh, Catalant have agreed to be our headline sponsor for our virtual summit in November um, and that's also quite exciting because we were planning a one-day summit at Steam and I find traditional one-day summits is quite hard you know we've got a heck of a lot to talk about in the tech field and uh, so going virtual having a week of events, we can we can appeal to everybody. We're going to have the the UX Swindon, Data Swindon, Swindon AI, Swindon Connect all running their events that week. We've got Royce with you, can we talk about IP and acquisition. We've got Set Square are going to be happy. Anita's going to be doing something. We're going to have an amazing suite of events. And it also doesn't limit us geographically. It doesn't matter where you are. You can come to a Tech Swindon virtual summit event. We do hope to maybe get some round tables um, that week as well. I'm hoping that will be viable. But I think it means we can appeal for, to, to the real tech, to the talent, to the business development and all the other nuances 
that Tech Swindon covers. And we were looking at diversity and inclusion and, and, and women in tech. There's so many great topics and to try and do all that justice in one day would have been really hard work. So the virtual summit makes me very excited and I had a great conversation as well with the British Computer Society this afternoon about how they can support with their membership. So the future is looking incredibly bright and I'm, I was allowed to give you that information even though Peter at Catalan only confirmed that an hour ago. So that's, that's quite exciting. Uh, and it's getting that momentum. So I think this is the beginning of, through the struggles, we're actually going to come out stronger and I think we're also more relevant. I think being uh, a, a, a fledgling community is hard. You've got to find your, the need that you are fulfilling. And COVID for most of our community has been actually a positive. We talked about this uh, the week before last in our last Swindon Founders, lots of pivoting and growth. We're in the best place to help our local economy and tech community. And I think we do that strongest together so yeah it's exciting times I'm really proud to have been a part of this actually I mean I joined quite cynically last year going is there anything going on and I was blown away by the amount going on and also how welcoming everybody's been you know doing this with Anita is just a, a representation of all the work we've been doing together since I started because I knew that Swindon founders and the techies needed to be working together and collaborating celebrating the great work that Anita already done and, and, and hopefully building upon that and making the event bigger and better in the future um so if you've not been on Hopping before, not, not everybody has, we have the chat feature to the right and we want you to keep talking. So when we get Grev and, and John on, it isn't that you sit and listen with, with uh, Hopping, which I love. This is a conversation. And that's one of the best things about going virtual is you don't have this polite audience waiting to say something that by the end has kind of worn off. We want your comments. We want to share your war stories. Um, heckle. Uh, Mark from... Um, Render said he's going to come along and heckle me, which is absolutely fine. You can do that. That's not a problem at all. That's what we, we want, the banter. You have the networking, which is over to your left, which you have a virtual networking for three minutes with somebody, um, which means you get to meet lots of people. And we're going to try something really different today. We've got some sessions which are on the three key themes that most founders struggle with, which is time, money and people. So we're going to go into those rooms probably after six o'clock and have some specific conversations. You can hop around rooms and talk to different people about different things, but we're going to try and have a chat on there and see how this goes. But uh, all about experimentation. And we've, we've enjoyed using all the different platforms on the different sessions. But thank you all for joining us. And we... I think we might do this again. But Anita, welcome. Thank you. Both. I'm just going to drink beer while you talk now. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> hi, everyone. If I know lots of people in the room, but there's some of you I don't know so well as well. It's great to be working with Lucy. Lucy and I have been chatting for a while now about ways that we can collaborate more and support one another. And it's great that this is the start of that. So I um, am the founder of the Business Exchange. We produce business magazines in print for Swindon and Wiltshire and Bath and Somerset, supported with websites for each area and um, social media coverage as well. We've been supporting lots of businesses through the crisis, trying to communicate all of the messages, whether it's making sure that businesses know that the discretionary grants are available. If you're in Swindon, there's a second round and it ends on Sunday. So uh, if you haven't applied yet and you think you might be eligible, have a little look at that one. So all of those kinds of key messages we've been pushing out through the crisis. And then through my work in Swindon and Wiltshire, um, we're celebrating seven years of the business exchange this summer. I don't know where the time is gone. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, through my work in those last seven years, um, it became apparent probably about four years ago that we had this amazing, thriving tech community in Swindon and Wiltshire and that it wasn't really being supported. So I thought, what can I do? Lots of publishers have award ceremonies. I wanted to do something that was a bit different. Um, and I thought, actually, how can we support the tech community? Would it be good to do some tech awards? So we launched the techies three years ago and uh, we were expecting to have by now hosted the third event, which would have been um, on the 21st of May. So the techies has had to pivot and deal with challenges and uh, everything that's been thrown at us uh, via co uh, through the COVID crisis. But the good news is that if you didn't know about the techies, uh, the ceremony um, is going to happen at the end of the year and the awards are still open until the 1st of September. We 
extended them because it just made sense to keep the competition alive and we really hope to get as many people as possible together at the end of the year and if, if people aren't comfortable meeting up in person we are looking at options um, and hop in might be one of them to do some virtual aspects of a, a techies event uh, we've had lots of entries already uh, but we would love you to enter uh, lots of different categories we've got a new um, category this year as well which is a startup category so if you're a newbie business in Swindon and Wiltshire find out about that um, some of our judges and sponsors are in the room this evening Kate Westbrook is our techies judge and Thrings is one of our sponsors and also Jane Lamper I think is in the room from Shore and Co um, and they're also a sponsor of the techies as well so it's it's great to have a mixture of judges and our tech community in the room tonight and uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to finally getting the awards off the ground and showcasing even more how amazing our community is locally and the amazing work that our techies have been doing in the last year or so since we hosted the last one. But one of the categories is flying the flag for Swindon and Wiltshire and what that really showcases when we get all of the entries in is how much talent is on our doorstep and what a mark our area is making on nationally and internationally so um, we need your entries we need to hear about your work if you are working on national products projects and international projects please get in touch and tell us about them from a business exchange point of view we want to hear your stories as well as for the techies as well so yeah if you want to find out all about it I will uh, put the web address um, with where you can find all the categories and those kinds of things and do badger some of our judges in the room tonight as well and they'll tell you what they're looking for from your entries um, the other thing I can tell you about the techies is it's a not a uh, chicken dinner black tie affair uh, you can wear what you like and we encourage you all to come up onto the stage if you've got a big team um, to enter the awards it's not um, or to collect an award it's not about um, one person it's about a team effort and that's what we try and embrace at the techies all of the people that come together to to make um, a business and to, to help you win awards so uh, yeah really looking forward to getting all of your entries in by the 1st of September and we'll see who the winners are for 2020. Now Shane has asked if he could change his entry since he put it in quite a lot's um, evolved in his business. I think we can allow that extenuating circumstances as they would say at school why not <laughs> <laughs> i can just see kate says yep signed off so uh, we've got a judge that signed up so that's good news <laughs> but it's so hard to tell i know you pushed it back a little bit and it's just so hard to tell isn't it with with you know events of that size when when we'll be able to get together to do it i know i'm hoping december we will see. It could be that it's a joint Christmas celebration and we can we can do something. If not, we will find a way of making it work. Yeah, get rid of this COVID thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and if it means that we have to host it in 2021 as or I have an event in 2021, so we all get together but announce the awards in this kind of environment online, then that's fine. We need to do mm. what's right and safe, don't we? So. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Grev is has finished. He's been teaching today, so he hasn't quite come backstage yet. But let's bring John on, on the panel. So, John, if you could put your microphone and uh, camera back on and come in. There you go. It worked. Hello. 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 <laughs> John, could you introduce yourself to everybody? I know I know there are some, some people who know you in the room, but just for those who don't. Sure. Um, I'm John Pansack. I am a chartered accountant by background, joined a small biotech uh, company many years ago as employee 20. We grew really quickly over five years to over 400, did a couple of joint ventures, one with Boots, one with Air Products. Um, and after that, um, five of us decided that we'd quite like to set up our own biotech company. So we went out and raised uh, three million from Rothschilds, Advent, people like that. And subsequently, I've done a float of a software company and I retired a few years ago. And now I kind of have a bit of fun kind of working with a few ambitious companies. 
And that the, la- the, the latter bit is kind of why I've got you involved. So I think that's the bit where some of the, the, the challenges, I mean, not the, I mean, you made your ride sound very easy then, didn't you? Oh, Grev, amazing timing. <laughs> As if by magic. Let me just get the right camera going. That's, that's a great shot there. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That has been the best thing, isn't it? Getting a view into everybody's houses. I'm in the corridor because uh, Graham's chucked me out of the living room. So this is the nature of the beast, isn't it, with uh, <laughs> with being on panels? <laughs> I've been trying to make a coffee all day. And every time I go downstairs, the coffee machine makes loads of noise. And my husband's on a conference call. I'm like, great, OK. <laughs> been needing coffee today. <laughs> <laughs> Have beer instead. It's all good. <laughs> oh, that's better. Good evening. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you very much. I have explained you've had a pretty intense day. Have you, have you got your beer with you? That's the question. Uh, no, no, no. I'm not really in the state. I've been in this chair for three days, in fact. Uh, I've been teaching for two and mentoring coaching companies for the first day, uh, whatever day that was. Oh, um, yeah. it's Thursday. It's Thursday, apparently. You're OK. It's all, you're almost there. Almost there. <laughs> so John's just given a little bit of background on, on, on his career so far. Grev, could you yeah. introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I originally studied electronics uh, and then uh, microprocessors and computer systems design. I uh, did my first stuff up in the 80s. Uh, I know, John, you'll remember those days. Uh, grew my company. Not long, percent <laughs> A year for three years and then exited uh, uh, and enjoyed myself. And uh, I sat in a garden for a while and I'm sure John will re- realize what that's like. Uh, one day I was looking at the Telegraph newspaper, as they used to have, a uh, jobs page, and uh, there was a cryptic advert in there. And I rang up the recruiter and said, if that's Intel, I'm interested. Otherwise, don't bother. And he said, if you could figure that out, it's Intel, then you better come down and talk to us. And uh, four days later, I was working for Intel, managing $60 million software, software and hardware business for them. Uh, after five years, I jumped across the chip industry and worked 16 years in the semiconductor industry, five in Silicon Valley, helped grow a $175 million business out there, came back to the UK in 2001, spent six years, uh, IP broker, buying and selling IP, doing a bit of M&A. And in 2001, I started mentoring spin outs from the University of Bristol, and I enjoyed that so much. In 2006, I created my own company, and I've just done that since then. In the last 10, 10 years, uh, I've helped 200 companies, helped 50 raise money and 16 exits. Uh, and at the same time, I've been doing teaching workshops and stuff and non-exec roles and non-exec chair roles. And you're a member of the Set Squared team, aren't you? So you're, he- yeah. you're here officially. Set Squared are sponsoring the biz and the event tonight. Yeah. So we're kind of picking your brains on that. And we were just saying that, Greg, that this is, we would call it an F word of a different name if we, if we, we weren't being good. So this is a failure session. So the reason I got you and John on board is... Um, well, oh, so Simon's on the beer as well. No, but Simon, it's not too early starting your beer. Go for it. Come on, cheers. Um, we want to. I thought we, we did ask some founders to come and share their their, their stories, but they're a shy bunch, as you, you both know. And so we thought we we'd get we get the ball rolling, and then we can go into the sessions a bit later and, and have some honesty uh, discussions as well. But I thought we'd focus on anecdotal, anonymized, obviously, on mo- the themes of money, people, and time. Because one key thing with tech founders is you, you start a business because you have a passion or an idea or a product, and then you start getting into the nitty gritty of running a business and have to deal with a lot of things that you don't really want to. Um, so let's, let's start. I mean, you've both done raises. So let's start with money. Where, I mean, I love watching Dragon's Den when someone says, you know, I've been trading for six months and I, and I, my business is worth 500 million. And, um, <laughs> so what do founders let's we'll go back to you john what do founders get wrong when it comes to valuations i think it's really difficult um i think when we started i mean we were five unemployed guys and we hadn't done anything um all we had was an idea that we wanted to set up a biotech company how the hell do you value something when you haven't actually done anything so um effectively what you're doing is valuing a future proposition and that's all we had really and i think it's really difficult i think it's like when you sell anything it's it's what someone is willing to pay for it um so we did all the normal stuff of trying to work out various ways of valuing the company 
but essentially what they were doing was buying an opportunity to do something a bit special um and we tried to we tried to create a, a good impression of treating ourselves as a bit special most of the vcs asked us to send full business plans and everything and we refused to do that we just sent them teaser type documents and then drip fed information along the way so we treated what we had as valuable um and they all of a sudden they began to treat us slightly differently okay on that topic Greg, Greg, do you think people ask for money too early ask for too much too soon uh and so i think there's a couple of points i'd like to raise is number one is don't watch dragon's den <laughs> it's car crash tv mm. uh whilst the questions they ask are quite relevant and, and quite common the, the whole scenario isn't real uh, my experience of uh, working with investors and whatever that's not how they work and not how they think so that's the number one thing don't watch car crash tv um uh, number two is don't talk to investors until you're ready the most dangerous thing you can do is have half-baked propositions and have conversations with investors because you're basically wasting your time and they do talk to each other. So if you've had a go and then you go back and get your act together and go back out again, it's amazing how investors have heard about your first go. So you need to be really, really ready and have everything, all your ducks in order and then go out in one movement to go out and try and raise money. So that's the key thing. And mm. you need to understand the motivation of the type of investor, and they do vary, uh, what will make them bite on your proposition. So uh, you have to have your funding strategy right. How much money do you need from who at what point to go for? Sometimes it's a single raise, sometimes it's multiple raises. You have to get your act together, uh, understand your strategy and how you raise money. Uh, do you think and you have to do it when you really need it? Mm. Uh, so, you know, you need to have a proposition, you need to have a product, you need to prove the market, you need to have customers engage in. There's all these things that investors will ask you about. And if you haven't got them, it weakens the relationship, weakens the proposition. And one of the things I want to find before you, you come back, uh, Lucy, um, investors score your, your work. You get one point for a good thing and minus 10 for a bad thing. Because investors are looking for reasons to reject you. They see thousands or hundreds of plans a year and they only invest four or five times. So you cannot afford any negatives because you lose all your good work from one negative. Well, based on your comment, I was going to say, do you think people tend to fish for money when actually they should hunt for it? So rather than just go, here's my great idea, throw it out there, go, as you just said, dating. I've got this product in this sector. These are the guys who invest in that. So kind of presenting the pitch to the person you know is going to like it. So rather than just putting the dating analogy, keeping going, just putting your profile on an app, actually finding the right person and almost going, right, I don't want to pitch this to anybody other than you because I know you've got the, the, the record I want. Yeah, exactly. You've got to know your audience. You've got to research the investors. Find the ones who know about your sector and invest in your sector. Find the ones that have got money, because that's the other aspect too, because um, uh, investors have different phases where they don't have any money, but they still talk to the company. So you need to find out who's got the money and really get to know them before, all right, we're going to choose these guys to, to talk to. Um, you could even talk to people they've invested in previously, couldn't they? If they've invested in somebody, give them give that founder a ring and go, how easy was that? Because I think that guy looks great. but. Yeah. I think you should lever I think this is people are quite naive. They just go, I've got a great idea. People will buy it. As you say, there's a lot of time and energy needs to be put in that structure. Because it isn't just a business plan. As you said, John, it's not a big document. Yeah. I think what you've got to do is you've got to look at it from the point of view of the investor. And a lot of investors are very different. We learned a lot of this stuff as we were going along. We we were basically doing primarily a, an R and D pitch initially. And you go along and you'd meet the first venture capitalist and they say, you haven't told us enough about sales and marketing and opportunity and that sort of thing. We changed our we changed our pitch. We met the next venture capitalist and they were R&D focused. And, and so <laughs> you, you began to realize that what we were doing is we were doing it from our perspective. And what you need to do is, as you said, Grev, is look at it and um, look at what the investor wants. Some so investors invest in different things for different reasons. You need to understand what those investors are looking for 
and you need to pitch your proposition in a way that's attractive to them. And also, there's no point in going to an investor which isn't suitable for you, to be quite honest, other than to practice, which we did do sometimes. We knew we wouldn't be going along and winning money, but it was a good experience to go through that pain of, of them having criticised your pitch um, because sometimes they came up with really good comments and we learned a lot through the process. I mean, we learned a lot about, um, you know, we thought we'd have to go along and find five or six investors. And we began to learn that really what you were doing is going along and trying to find a syndicate leader pretty well. And the syndicate leaders then found the rest of them, if you like, because th th these guys know each other. And typically what happens is there's one guy who leads on this particular investment, another one leads on another, and they all follow each other. And what, from an investor, what do they want to see you using the money for? So if you're, you're going to somebody, I have an example, uh, anonymized obviously, of somebody who got £150,000 of investment. He went and hired a group of people, didn't manage them, didn't make any sales and got rid of them all three months later. Um, it's an extreme example. It's a true one. It was horrible to watch because you could see what he was doing. But how much does an investor want you to break down? You know, if I give you a million, what are you spending it on? And what do they want to hear? I Greg, think, I mean, yeah. uh, oh. Personally, I, I, I actually think the main thing an investor is looking for when they're investing in your company is they're, look, they're investing in the people, to be quite honest. And a lot of the time what they're doing is asking loads of questions and I'm, I'm going to exaggerate. Um, they almost don't care what the answer is. They just want the, to make sure the answer makes sense and you've thought it through, really. Um, and, and what they're doing is evaluating the people. I mean, with, our, with ours, when we did it, we spent a day at, I think it was UCL, going through God knows how many tests and stuff with um, the biotech people at UCL. Um, you know, so it's the people they're looking at more than the answers because these guys actually realised they didn't know a lot of the answers. They knew a lot of the questions. Um, and so all they want to know is, is have you thought about it? And that's your main job as a founder is to think, think, think and refine. So they want to know that their money's in a safe pair of hands rather than the actual minutiae. Yeah. yeah. Grave, what are your thoughts on that one? So I totally agree it's the people they back. Uh, however, they do want to know how you're going to use their money to add value. You really got, people don't really look at what you spend it on. They want to say, when you put this money into that thing, how is it going to add value to the business? Yeah, I'm going to double the R&D team because this will advance the IP development so we can hit the market sooner. They want to understand the value that you're adding and those answers that you're giving, if you can give those answers in the context of, Here's how it reduces the risk and adds value to the business. I agree with that, Grev, that effectively what you're also doing, I think, is you think of the business in terms of milestones, business milestones that you're hitting. And so you're, you're, you're saying, uh, you know, 200,000 of, of the million I'm raising is going to achieve this milestone and that milestone and that milestone. So they've got measures, they've got things that they can evaluate you on later, if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and they'll hold you to account for it. Exactly. So exactly. there's only one rule in business. I always say to people I'm mentoring, it always costs more and takes longer. Correct. So when you raise money, you want to raise money that takes you beyond the point of those milestone steps. Yeah, mm -hmm. because raising money, uh, more money from people when you haven't quite made it yet, mm -hmm. makes life extremely tough. So I always say that when you raise money, raise enough money to go beyond the, the potential point where you have a milestone, which will be a value uplift and you yeah. can raise money on a higher valuation. If you but that's, one of, the, that's one of the difficult things to do. That I mean, we had two thought processes. We could, we could raise a million pounds and get to a certain milestone. That's what we thought. Or we could raise three million, which is what we thought we would need um, overall, and not have to worry about doing a fundraiser in the middle because fundraising takes a hell of a lot of management time. And so you have these and you're trying to work out because you think if I raise a million and, a chip, and a hit that milestone, I'll be able to raise a further two million at a higher valuation. But you've also got to take into account the fact you've got to spend two, three months raising the money. And what happens if you don't? Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. I think um, people do underestimate the time commitment. As you both saying, the research, the time, 
yeah. gaining investment can become a full-time job but then what happens to your your company exactly. yeah exactly well, it was easy for us because we were unemployed and we in <laughs> higher tech, you couldn't do anything without money. So it was the only well, thing we had to do. That leads you on quite nicely to people, though, because is somebody's if is it if it's the founder's role as the person with the vision, the story, the the plan, the and the energy and also, as you say, the right character, the investable person to go out and be the face. They then have to hire somebody to keep the business going. And people is another big challenge in in startups i mean you quite often have a founder or a, a group of founders employee official number one two three is sometimes when it starts getting creaky and grav i'd like to start with you on kind of some of the people mistakes you've seen people make when they're setting up their, their tech business uh so most people when they start out don't have all the skills they need for the ones i see uh you don't need to hire them all as employees there's lots of way you can build a team, and I call it the virtual team. Yeah, you're going to have people who are willing to work with you, and then have the promise of a job further down the line when funding comes in. You've got people who can help you because they want to help you, like mentors and coaches and so on. It's a good thing to do is to build yourself a virtual team of advisors and helpers, so that then you can achieve more by doing that uh, earlier. Uh, most people find it lonely to run a business on your own. Mm. Uh, if you've got a team around you that helps you, the stress, the ups and downs, the creativity gaps, all those kind of things, and the problem solving, the skills. So you need to think about how do I build a team? Uh, and you can do it with a virtual team to begin with. But ultimately, as time goes on, I think I actually talk to people about designing the organization you need to work towards. Yeah, what will it look like in the future? And this is something that investors want to know is that you understand the structure of the business in year two and year three and year four and what kind of people you need, what kind of skills and what kind of numbers. And if you don't understand the mechanics of your business that are allowed to do that, that investors will look at you as being not the right person to lead the company. But you uh, always start a business with the exit strategy in mind as well. So if in that plan, it's when you are no longer there, should be part of that plan. That's not being unromantic about it. But as you say, it's almost setting up a business that will kind of run itself to allow you to go off and do other things or, yeah. or for, to be saleable. That exit strategy in mind. Seen. You have no choice about that. Day one, when you get the money from the venture capitalists, every major decision you make after that has got to be consistent with them exiting the business in five <laughs> years' time or whatever their time scales are. You have no choice. That's yeah. how they think. And that's what you're buying into if you're going to take their money, I'm afraid. Yeah. And there are different flavours of money because obviously that's the other thing to have in that, going back to the money side, is what type of investor do you want? Do you want an angel investor? Do you want a VC? There are different flavors. Going back to those nuances, do you want them to be hands on, hands off, on the board, leaving you the money with them? You know, you've got to have all that dynamic of that relationship in your head as to what you want from somebody before you go and ask them for money. Because hmm. again, like a relationship, they may think this is great. I'm going to be on that guy's shoulder every five minutes telling him what to do. And you're going, actually, I want you to leave me to it. You've got to have hmm. that's yeah. the, we talked about this in Show Me the Money. That prenup is really important. So everyone understands the dynamic of the relationship so it doesn't go horribly wrong and end up in a messy divorce. Because yeah. it does with, with, with investors and with founders. I mean, I've seen co-founders go through that if they don't understand the dynamic of their relationships going forward hmm. and their values in the business. I completely agree. I think with all of these things, it's a bit like a marriage, really. You've got to go through a courtship and you've got to get, an, if you're going to, co I mean, we co the, the example I'm thinking of, there was five of us and it's really difficult. We we spent a lot of time trying to make sure that we all saw things the same way. We were all committed to the same degree. Um, our, one of our big decisions that was really frightening was we, we were trying to raise money in London, but we also went to Boston and Stanford. We could have raised 10 times more money than we did for the same equity if we'd have gone to Boston or Stanford. That's, what, that's the deal that was on the table. But there was one main provider. We all had to move. Yeah. You know, they wouldn't give us money if we were in the UK. We had to move yeah. to the States. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really difficult decision for us. Five, yeah. five founders is hard. I think two or three is quite good because you can have quite a dynamic, but five. Yeah, but we were all working together. We all knew each other. Skills, isn't we're it? All really? it's gonna be... <laughs> yeah, but it's still hard to have five founders. Yeah. Yeah. Most of my experience with multi founder teams is that somewhere down the line, there's going to be a problem. Uh, mm. And it, 
it's not necessarily because of the relationship it's the understanding that's is diverges yeah and you may find that founders will want to do one thing with the company and grow it and exit other founders want a job forever or somebody wants to leave the company and what happens then so i, I think it's really important early on to get a shareholder agreement mm. and a plan of action and a shareholder vision for the company that everybody is signed up to so that in a year or two's time they can't come back to you and say i never agreed to that i don't remember us agreeing to exit the business in three years and not five oh, i agree yeah i totally it's agree with that Grev, because yeah. also you're you're negotiating or you're discussing the shareholders agreement at a time when nobody has an angle if someone if you do it three years down the down the line people yeah. have had an opportunity to go off in slightly different directions uh, or there may be a sale event on the table or whatever. And so all of a sudden, people's heads are in a different place. So I could tell a horror story if you want to hear a horror story. Go for it. Uh, uh, a horror story basically is three guys buying the company. Uh, they each agree to put 10K in to start the company off. One doesn't have the money, so he borrows it from his uncle. And 18 months down the road, they don't have a shareholder agreement. 18 months down the road, the one guy who borrowed the money to decide i don't like being a business anymore uh i don't have the money to pay my uncle back so he gave the uncle his shares and then for the following two years the uncle blocked any uh fundraising or equity sale anything like that which completely stifled the company wow they stop it because i had no good lever bad lever transfer of equity no agreement on that process and it took them the best part of three years to come to an agreement where they could buy the company could buy out the shares of the uncle and then they raised the money and then they've made a huge exit which i bet the uncle's really upset about now but ultimately they've had an exit so this is a typical thing that i see that at the point where everybody's still friends they don't think they need a formal agreement but i would say get a shareholder agreement so everybody knows get a shareholder vision and goals of what you're trying to do with the business and get it all signed up and what's your it. opinion on working with family and friends <laughs> <laughs> silence speaks volumes yeah. guys <laughs> yeah i think it, the answer is it depends yeah yeah i think conventional wisdom says don't do it but it depends yeah I there think that's right. Pardon? I think that's right. Um, I think in most cases, it's probably not a good idea to be blunt about it. Um, I think there are too many pressures and things get too tight for one reason or another. Um, I think fa running family businesses is is uh, is, is something um, quite, well, it's not unusual. It obviously happens a lot, but it has a lot of its own difficulties. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you just you can't leave it at the door can you that's the problem there's no what, balance you need to ask someone say would you be prepared to fire this family member mm -hmm. Ooh, yeah so my father wanted to invest in my first business and i said no he was upset for me with me for a while but then he got over it but i realized it would be a problem if i had a problem further down the road or if the yeah. company went bust he lost his money or whatever so i'd have to live with the consequences for the rest of my life and i decided i didn't want to do that um, it's it's interesting though Greg you say that and yet a lot of founders are told you know you, the first round of finance that you raise should be from your friends and family yeah yeah so so when they do they have to have a decent shareholder agreement and they have to understand the voting rights and all it, it has to be really really clear but my father wanted to join the business <laughs> That's yeah. different <laughs> he, thought he, he thought he was a really great business person he had two successful careers and I didn't really want that. So I knew I knew it would cause problems at some point. So uh, the key thing here is if you can have a family member, it's, it's a pure shareholder with non-voting shares, uh, and they really understand what's happening when you take money from them, they are taking a risk. If you completely understand all of that, then they're just another shareholder uh, that will get diluted at some point. But this is a point where we talked about this in Show Me the Money. This is a point where you've got to get legal advice. This is not a thing you can do yourself. <laughs> Um, this is, yeah, this is one, again, this kind of, you do hear a lot of founders trying to save money on finance and legal are the two things they think they can botch themselves. You, this is the form you can't Google. 
you've got to get all those nuances in there so that it's watertight moving forward. Because as you said, Grev, people change. You might get into the business as young grads. Now you all, and then somebody wants to move to the US. Someone gets married. Um, you know, you've all got your, your priorities in the world change, whatever age you are. I mean, I use grads as that as an extreme example, but we all change and you've got to allow for that in your business model. You've got to allow for that in any management model, haven't you, of any scale of business, really. Mm -hmm. But it's just so much rawer at the beginning of that startup investment period. And if you're not all on the same journey, try and agree the right job roles. If there are a group of you, have a manager. I, I was working with a company in Sussex where there were there were three directors who were all equal. Well, that doesn't help anybody. It became, it was brothers and a, and, um, a third third gentleman. And it just meant that they were the, they're the parents of the family. The decisions weren't made. That You'd have staff going to different members because there was no managing director. One of them yeah. was leading, but all three of them had exactly the same power. Yeah. And it okay. was messy. Yeah. It made, made everything mistake, harder. Lucy. Yeah. We made the, exactly, the five of us, we, we met our first VC and we thought of ourselves as a, workers cooperative we're all equal all that sort of stuff and we had our first meeting with vc that's the first time any of us had met a vc and it changed at the end of the meeting <laughs> we appointed one of us as, as kind of chief executive or managing director yeah but that also flushes out the conversation about the roles ambitions goals you know, the people who are really going to drive it, the people who are there for the ride. There's always different balances. It's, you know, never sometimes not that extreme. But as you say, where do you want this business to be in five years? Well, I want to be on a beach. I've sold it. Yeah. Well, actually, I see this me running it in 15 years time. And it's just, and that still could change. But at least if you get an idea that's sticking the ground of where you are and what this means for you, you can move it forward. Hmm. But these are conversations that founders don't have. There's this naivety. There's this romanticism. It is going back exactly to that marital. They've fallen in love. This is all so exciting. It can never go wrong. Yeah. But it's very expensive. As you were, just exactly that example, it's very expensive and very long winded when it does go wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, I've seen founders who are avoiding people in the street that they founded businesses with because it's all become so traumatic. And I running a business like, is hard anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like anything, you know, any problem. And it doesn't just, it's not just founders, but any business problem. You have to think it through. You have to think it through properly and you have to work out all the angles and just be careful about it. As I say, before we we started trying to raise money or anything like that, we spent a lot of time discussing what you just said, Lucy. How, what do we each want out, out of it? We'd identified the roles that the five of us were going to have. So we knew all that sort of stuff. But we we had to work out what our own personal ambitions were and then see how consistent that was with what we were setting up. So convert our personal aspirations into corporate aspirations and then work backwards from that. And I think there's that self-knowledge. I think very early on in your career, you may not be able to answer that. And that's why one of my favourite stats is that I think 45 is the most successful age to start a business because you've got enough for the business to then survive. I think a lot of businesses are founded by you know, sort of grads, but the ones that actually last the distance are of a more mature age range because they actually do know themselves better and know what they will and won't stand for. But I don't know. Obviously, Graven, Set Squared, obviously, is a university incubator. So you're seeing a lot of those graduates coming out yeah. with so, fresh, exciting so, ideas. So first thing is uh, the Set Squared incubator takes companies from outside as well as from the, from the university. So uh, we have a mixed bag. Uh, but you don't need to be 45. What you do is you get a chair who's got the, the reputation experience, who can help build the, build the company. And I always say to people who are quite young, first thing you've got to do, guys, is get yourself somebody that can be a chair or be somebody that you can look at, can help you, guide you, mentor you, build, build the right structures with the kind of experience. Yeah, so it doesn't really matter about the age thing. Yes, experience counts, but you can bring it in. in you can borrow way. that. Yeah. <laughs> you can borrow it yeah. Yeah. I actually think that's one of the main advantages that people have nowadays compared to a few years ago the concept of part-time senior people part-time market directors part-time FDs you know non-exec directors or I mean non-exec directors have been around for a long time and we use them when we were young when I was younger all the companies I've been involved with, we had non-exec directors. I always thought it was a great combination because the young people have to drive the ambition and yeah. um, all that sort of stuff and the experience in their niche business. 
but yeah. they don't have much business experience. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. It's just, if you haven't done it, why should you know it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it, I thought it was a powerful combination. And unfortunately now I'm the older guy. I, I prefer it at the other end, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> you can do a Benjamin Button, John. We'll get you going backwards now. It'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I look forward to being 45 and being about at my best. <laughs> But I find, as if I'm chairing a company of, of younger people, I get revitalized by it. I'm excited by it. Yeah? Uh, uh, totally. And uh, I, I, it doesn't matter what age I am. Uh, but the key thing here is if you've got a good team with a good product, they're good business, and they listen and they learn, <laughs> uh, it's such a brilliant thing to do to build, help build a company. And I've worked with several companies, and they've gone from one level to something five or ten times bigger. I'm the kind of person I like to get in. So we have this kind of concept of first mile, second mile, third mile in Sets Web, where we talk about the first mile is taking a product to your, to the first sale. The second mile is the first sale to the first million or so. Uh, and the third mile is maybe you're scaling a business to raise funding or whatever. I really love the first mile into the second mile stage. And when it turns into a proper job, I'm off for the hills. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because I'm not really interested in a proper day job, you know? I'm interested in helping build stuff, teach people, develop it and whatever. And I've walked away from several uh, chair roles when they've got to a point where it's actually a second mile job now and somebody else who likes to take uh, a company to tens of millions is better. Uh, But you can bring these people in and they can help you grow the business and you don't need to be precious about it. Quite a lot of uh, entrepreneurs I meet are really afraid of bringing in the experience and letting go. Uh, the best uh, kind of entrepreneur is somebody that says, okay, let's just go as a group, you know, rather than I have to be the one, I have to know everything and I have to be in front and, and it doesn't really help. Good I, I, to- I, I agree with that, Greg. I think effectively um, some founders are afraid almost of appearing as though they, uh, to their staff and people around them, as though they don't know everything. Whereas actually, I think it's the other way around. The cleverest, the brightest people are the people who recognize what they're good at and recognize where they need help. Yeah. Those are the clever people. Yeah, and they build a team, they bring it together and they build it and take it forward. Mm-hmm. And they're not really precious mm-hmm. about, and they don't have egos to get in the way of doing that. And that is really- oh, I great. totally agree. We, we always say when we look for businesses, we look for two things, ambition and open-mindedness. You know, if they hit, if they hit those two things, then we feel they've got a chance of success, if you like. If they don't have, if they're not open minded, I, I, we always think that they're less likely to be successful. Yeah. But it's almost an insecurity. I think it goes along with the, the a word that I really don't like, which is entrepreneur. This idea that you're this special, magical being who has superhuman powers and can do everything in the business. The businessmen that we probably most all admire have amazing teams behind them. As you say, they, they might be the figurehead. It could be, you know, the, the Richard Branson or the Elon Musk or the Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or whoever you want to name that we all know as sort of people, business leaders. They would all admit that they were only where they were because of that amazing team of people behind them who make it look easy. They all know their, their weaknesses and their strengths. And they are and other people like Bill Gates and his constant learning. They're forever challenging themselves. And they're not afraid to be challenged. I think that security in themselves where they know they don't know everything makes a founder that's much more fun to work with as well. Because as you guys both know, I, I was at Sussex Innovation Centre, one of the original business incubators. And just like you, Grev, I love fledging them. I loved having them for that period. And then you don't need me anymore. when We, we chuck them off and get somebody else at the beginning. So satisfying, so challenging personally as well to go through those journeys with them. Because a lot of their, their most painful periods. But the founders who would just lay just be there and try and be open. There were some that it was just like they'd ask for help and then ignore you. And you'd go around that circle a few times and then have to give up hmm. and it, yeah. it, and they'd fail and you'd see them hurtling towards a brick wall and they still wouldn't stop. Yeah. But the founders that recognize that they are great at that early stage as well, um, but they are not what I would call um, traditional managers and business people, if you like. And it's a very unusual person who can be great at that early stage and also great at building the company later. I think the best people are the founders who've got the vision, who can build that company, if you like. And then once 
you start getting into a stage where things that I was going to say routine, but you know what I mean? You're just cranking things out and growing along a normal path. Then you need a different type of person to lead it usually. Yeah. And walking away from, from potentially their baby is quite hard for that founder, but they have to recognize that's their strength is to pass it on and go into something else. So that's why you have serial serial entrepreneurs people who just keep going and just full of ideas but then when they get stuck because they think they ought to run a business they don't know why they they hate it so much because it's so out of their comfort zone to be doing that so you meet quite a few grumpy entrepreneurs because it's or founders because it's got to a stage where it's not as much fun as it was Mm -hmm. so maybe they just need to step back and as you say let somebody else do that stuff while they go and maybe they have they they let that up as business a while they go off and play with business b yeah or maybe just do a different job yeah because quite often they don't enjoy the work and they'd love to do something else like design products and stuff. So you say, why don't you just do that and hire somebody who's really good at scaling a business Uh, and you can watch them do it and maybe do it yourself next time round. Yeah. Don't, don't look at it as a sense of failure that you have to move sideways to become the CTO or the R and D director or whatever. Look at it as you've got a better person growing your business for you. Think like a shareholder who says, I want the best people running the company so I get the best growth of it. Don't and look a, like it. A lot of tech founders, are exactly that. A lot of tech founders are like, I'm not making things anymore. I like making a platform, making a widget. And I'm suddenly doing managing people you know financial accounting i did not get into business to do this i set up this business because i like making widgets and that's what i want to do so and as you say that's the best place for them to be because if that's the way their brain works the bis- they will be that they will be the i the the ideas lab basically which is where they should be they should be in the innovation team and they should have people running hr and operations and all the stuff that switches off that founder completely and isn't the best use of their time that's a key theme isn't it is mm. the founder being really brutal about what the best use of their time is so even if it went on the investment and raising another member of their team might be doing all that research for them and wheeling out the founder to to be the show and then putting him or her back in the box while they mm. negotiate on the details i think one of the things that a lot of people have trouble with is hiring people who are better than them as well, who are cleverer than them and better at certain things. But it's what you need to do. It's I think if there's one lesson I've learned over the years, really, it's much better to have a smaller team, but really, really talented people than just throw numbers of people at it, which is what what a lot of companies do. They just throw numbers of people at it rather than talent. We I was in a company that the company that floated, we were the best in the world at a particular type of software. And we didn't have a huge software development team. We had quite a small software development team. But my God, were they hot, if you like. They were incredibly hot. Very difficult to manage, but they were hot. And I think, you know, when you when you think like that of just hiring the best, the best you can afford, it's it's you, you're on the way, if you like, to succeeding, I think. But you do have managerial problems then. <laughs> I think a lot of tech founders like to hire what they know. So they will build a big tech team because they'll hire lots of geeks and lots of geeks will sit and build and they'll be they'll in that build it and they will come because they don't understand sales and marketing. This is being very cliched, but they, they don't really understand sales and marketing. They don't know how to hire somebody. So they might hire the wrong salesperson, a bit of a snake oil merchant because they don't understand how to articulate. They don't understand value proposition and features and benefits. And I mean, Grav, I'll ask you this one. How do you help a tech founder go to market? I, I, I liked your comment about sort of hiring people on a more part-time basis because they don't know how to hire a salesperson. They don't really know what this look, they're looking for. Yeah, and it, They may not yeah. even know who they're selling to. Uh, the first salesperson is the most fired job in startups because you, you hire someone that you think is really great and then three months later you fire them because they haven't sold anything. And the fundamental problem is salespeople are really good at selling themselves. Exactly right. Half the time, (laughs) the problem is with the founder. You see, hiring a salesperson, you need to aim them at the right target and give them the right ammunition to achieve what you need to achieve. So to a certain extent, you have to teach them, train them, provide them with the tools. And most founders don't know how to do that. Yeah. And so the key thing here is, uh, the set, a good salesperson is just a tool, but you've got to really, uh, uh, you can't just go, oh, here's my product, now go sell it. Yeah, it, it's more involved than that. Now, if you have it's, experienced people in your team, they can guide you along that and say, right, okay, let's hire a person, but let's make sure we do the job right, give them the right tools, aim them at the right targets, give them the good sales story, 
tell them how they should sell it, what they should sell it for, and then they, and you arm them, and then they can do their job. I think I totally agree with that. But take, moving that forward, effectively, I think that's why in the early stages, it is best if you can possibly do it to hire people that you know or hire people that are recommended to you rather than just go, and particularly in salespeople, as you said, Greg, salespeople are good at selling themselves. And it's very easy to be conned, if you like, to be blunt about it. And they come up with all these wonderful statistics about you know, the 200% of budget and all this type of thing. And you don't know what to believe and, and they're very good. So it, the best thing to do is to hire people that are recommended one way or another. It's, it, it, you, you may not hire the, the complete best, but at least you know what you're getting, really. <laughs> I think you need a bridge between the tech and the sales. I think actually marketing is a good place to start because the problem is a tech person trying to translate to a salesperson when they haven't, you almost need to go from tech to marketing, which puts that research and that branding and who you are and what you do to create a message to then give to the salesperson because salesperson, they're simple creatures. I'm one of them. You know, they're not going to get their heads around it. Um, you need to kind of package it up in a nice little this is the person who's going to buy it and this is why they're going to buy it, go kind of way, which is what marketing would do for you. But a lot of people think marketing is something way off there or they think it's inbound. You know, we'll just do some SEO and some pay-per-click and we'll, we'll, we'll get there. But you've got to look at, you've got to go back to your, 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 your buying personas, haven't you? All that old school stuff of really battening down who your, your core potential buyer could be. And that is all branding and marketing. Because yeah, a sales guy is also only as good as the material and, and if you can't explain what your product does for people, he's, he, he or she's got no chance. Mm -hmm. Do feel sorry for them. So that brings on to our final sort of point of the three rooms that we're about to go into, which is time. Founders have never got enough time. If they, with this, you know, if they've got some money, they're, they're running around trying to work out how to spend it. If they've got no money, they're work, running around worrying about it. Advice yeah, from you, advice from both of you guys on time and time management. Delegate, delegate, delegate. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> Simple. But the problem is, who to? Are we, are we, I mean, this is it. If you've got no money, who are you delegating it to? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I was being flippant, but, but <laughs> the point is still true. If you're a founder and you've got some people, a lot of founders find it very, very difficult to, um, to give things up. And I think the best thing you can do is pass as many things as you possibly can to the person, the most junior person capable of doing it effectively. Um, so at least if you think like that, you've got a chance. Um, and I'm afraid running a company is all about difficult decisions. So when there's not enough time, you have to prioritize, you know, bottom line. I think as it'd be quite brutal about what's the best use of your time. Because you, you can spend, you can waste, we talked about VCs, you could waste three months of your yeah. project on that. Mm -hmm. So I, I tell a big bricks, little bricks story to entrepreneurs. Yeah, because every entrepreneur that ever started a company had a thousand things to do, but they only have enough time to do 10. So the key thing here is when you're running out of time, do less. Number one story. And what you do has to be a big brick not a little brick, yeah? And the brick size depends on the impact in the business and its strategy and that when the impact arrives. So a big brick is something that if you did it, it had a big impact on the business and it did it soon. A little brick is something that doesn't make much of a difference and might take a long time to have any impact. And what you do is you take a thousand things and you pick the big bricks out of it, the 10 you can do, and you just don't do the rest. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's better it's better to do 10 things well than 20 things badly. Yeah. The Americans when I was in when I was in Intel, the Americans loved a thing called ZBB. It's gone out of fashion. It's ancient stuff. ZBB is zero based budget. So you list all the things you have to do in priority order, you put time against them, and when you run out of time, you don't do the rest. And that simple thinking process allows founders to sort out what they're going to do because and accept and get used to the fact that they're not going to be able to do everything and kidding themselves they could do a thousand things is just going to kill themselves so for me it's big bricks little bricks i think that's i think that's the biggest problem we have when we're working with people is um 
you get founders who were slogging their guts out and working 16, 18 hours a day. And we keep having a conversation with them about what happens when the company is twice as big, 10 times as big. You can't, you're not, this solution isn't scalable. We need to find a better way, a different way. So let's work it out now rather than you have a nervous breakdown. Because, yeah. I mean, it genuinely is true. You work with people who have got great ambitions, great companies, great products, et cetera, but you you really worry they're going to burn out. <laughs> Absolutely. And I would say right now for founders, um, a good thing, uh, actually some of this was planned pre-COVID, but a good thing of, of the recent uh, experience of the last few months is the amount of wonderful business support programs coming out. Mm -hmm. Obviously the Set Squid Innovation Workshop is amazing and free. And doing things like a facilitated business model canvas, just getting it all out of your head. Because I found you carry a lot around with you. So you, I would tap into all those resources. There's startup, there's scale up, free mentoring. There's lots of mentors. If you, if you right now ask somebody on LinkedIn, people are giving their time. People will listen to you. People, and you've got Nat now. It's Accelerator has mentoring, which I, I, I do as well. There's lots of advice and free support out there. And it's free as in fully funded. It's amazing. I hate the word free because it really undervalues the, the content that's being put out there right now. So we're, we're going to share all of that on our website as well. But there's some amazing things out there that the founders need to tap into. It's been a good few years since you've had this amount of business focused support. Probably a good three or four years before the last lot of uh, European money that we had. And we need it right now. But I think it's just making sure that we tap into it because it's almost my concern is there's almost too much coming. And I think for a founder, it's differentiating, it, isn't it, to look at the quality and, and picking the right chunks because it's, it's kind of feast or famine, which is typical, isn't it, with business support programs. But there's, lo there's lots coming. Now, we're going to try something new now. We've got three sessions. So uh, Anita and, and I and Jane, who's hopefully here, she's been very quiet, Jane. This is not like her. I'm I hope sure she's with I us. saw her saying that she had a glass of wine on the chat. Oh, jolly good. That's fine. So I don't, we're going to go and we're going to try and, and go into some sessions which aren't being recorded. This bit is recorded. So that's why we've all been incredibly politically correct, obviously. So we can go into some sessions and... <laughs> <laughs> and, and be less so but we also have the networking as well but do this chat that will still be live so you want to stay here john's leaving us already that's all good nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> i have one burning question for you both which i think is really really poignant right now you've both grown businesses through recessions i believe what would your top tips be mm. grav do you want to <laughs> uh, okay so there's two things you have to you have to manage the, the crisis in the recession so you have to really know your numbers manage your cash but i wrote a blog about this recently um it's kind of like a car that's in the skid yeah you've got to steer where you want to go uh in order to make sure you don't focus just on the crisis so yes you have to get your act together in a current recession but you now should start looking at where's my business in 2021? Which of the customers am I currently talking to are gonna to survive to 2021? Am I looking after my customers in 2021? Will my business have a business model in 2021? So you have to get the balance right. You have to look at the short-term current crisis recession and how you're gonna survive that. And then you have to look at the long-term. And I think probably a lot of companies are just looking at survival right now, when next year they might not have a business and need to think about it long-term plan john what do you think um i'm i'm a quite an optimistic person and i tend to think when things are bad if you like that creates opportunities as well and i mean i'm not sure this applies quite so much to founders but for quite a few smaller companies um i think you have to recognize that a lot of bigger companies are going to be paralyzed they've got longer decision making cycles they don't know what's going to happen. And that creates opportunities for SMEs, if you like. And I think what you've got to do is you've got to think, have a really clear plan. You've got to um, you've got to be brave and you've got to have the financial muscle to ride it through, so to speak. But I think if you have those things together, then I, I actually think there's a huge number of opportunities out there. But I think most people kind of throw their hands up in horror and don't do anything. Whereas I, I almost think you should be doing the opposite. I'd much prefer people take some actions, if you like, and try and control their own destiny rather than let 
the world control their destiny. I prefer to fail because I failed rather than because the circumstances, if you like. Um, but as you said, Grove, as well, cash is king. You've got to have the finance, the finance behind you. Otherwise, I'm afraid you're constraint driven. If you're not constraint driven, then what I said earlier on, I think is appropriate. You have to be brave, think it through and go for it because your competitors will be doing things like they'll be cutting marketing, they'll be cutting cl customer support. They're going to have a lot of pissed off clients, if you like. Go after them, steal them. I don't care if the market's growing or declining. There's still, if the market declines 20%, there's 80% to go for. Go and take them. You know, be brave, do it. <laughs> And on that note, things like Facebook marketing became much cheaper because all the big brands pulled it. So the small companies could get in there and get a lot more bang for their buck. So actually, while the big guys were, were, were dialing it down, everybody who was spending money on that was getting far more traction. Right. Huge. I mean, Facebook was incredibly cheap. <laughs> mm, it was great. Anita, I mean, you're talking to a lot of businesses in this area as well. What, how are you seeing them evolve? I think everyone, there was a paralysis bit at first, I think, where everyone was just looking everywhere for what information they could absorb that was going to help them in their business. And I think now we've got past that and we're in a phase where people are, right, OK, things are moving again. I need to get out there. They are noticing gaps and noticing where they they may have a bit of a lead over the competition. And I think that they are getting going. I think there's lots of positive stuff in the community and mm. we need to embrace that rather than the negative messages out there. And I think that's like John said, he's a, a positive person, tries to cling on. I think that's what we all need to do rather than think, oh, it's a recession again. Actually, there are boarded up shops. The, the high street is a completely different kettle of fish I think this time to the last recession last time we had a recession in Bath for example everyone was out in the restaurants that all of the shops were filled you walk into Bath now expensive city in the UK well populated normally never normally has not an, an issue and there are lots of boarded up places so I think we've got different challenges but mm. as techies and as digital businesses I think the the time is now folks well, they're growing. I mean, obviously, Land Talk last uh, two weeks ago have gone from seven to twelve people over lockdown. Um, Shane, I know his his team is 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 growing and his business model is evolving. Um, everybody we've spoken to in Swindon Founders, kind of the smaller community, are all thriving because they're all they've all got basically the bit between their teeth and seeing this as an opportunity because it's just the way they're hardwired. I think a lot of good founders uh, embrace the change. But I think you're right. The bigger guys, it's it's turning that tanker, isn't it? And it's an opportunity. I'm interested to see how many more companies have started during this period. People who maybe aren't working in retail anymore, and as you say, whose jobs have changed. Will we see a big flurry of, of new tech startups? We hope I so. I think we will. <laughs> and I've, I've heard lots of people coming to me and saying, what do you think of my idea already? Brilliant. Um, so that there are people out there. So, uh, no, it's, exci it's exciting times. And I think we just need to know where to go to access funding to access support and make the most of everything and don't be afraid to ask use your linkedin profiles like lucy said and ask i've got this question who can help me and i think lots of people are giving their goodwill that there's much more of a community spirit than ever and we need to embrace that then the actually, that, that, go on, sorry go on. sorry go on, john no i i think that's a really important point uh you know, big companies tend to operate by themselves or if they need someone, they go and buy them. But basically what happens, I think, in SME land, we very much encourage our clients to work together, even though they're in completely different sectors. And I think the SME community has the best chance of, of beating the bigger guys by extending their reach, if you like, through their, I call it friends and family, people they know. Um, and, and you shouldn't be afraid of using that. I think you we should all be trying to help each other. I think that community spirit that you spoke about is exactly right. The other thing I wanted to put in a good word for is, I don't know if any of you have heard of B Corp. I've become a real fan of B Corp. And B Corp is about, it's effectively purpose-driven companies, if you like, who treat all their yeah. stakeholders ethically in the right way. And I think younger people, people like myself, obviously, are really into all this sort of stuff, really. And it's basically saying that you're going to treat all your stakeholders in a proper professional way. And that means your employees, your customers, your suppliers, 
the environment, CSR type stuff. And I actually think this is going to be a growing movement. Ben and Jerry, Patagonia, Pucker Teas over here, Pucker Herbs are all B Corp type companies. And I think that sort of purpose driven companies with with a good set of values behind them is going to be a growing movement over the next few years. And I think if I was an early stage founder now, I think I'd be trying to buy into doing that sort of stuff, you know, if not at the very beginning, fairly soon. There's lots of paperwork involved, but I definitely think it's worth it. Oh, it's one of our companies has done it. And we, we, I've become a complete fan, if you like. I think it's the right thing to do. I think that could set us off on a whole conversation about the new normal, couldn't it? I don't think we're going to go back to business as usual entirely. And it's it's looking at what bits of this we take the positives, as you say, and eat of the bits that we keep. Um, whether that's balance, flexibility, doing business differently, being local, locals become more important, the community being open to to being out of requested for help. We're asking I think it's become more uh, correct to ask for help. None of us are okay. Nobody's enjoyed lockdown in different nuances. We've all had different levels of challenges. Grev has been in that chair for four days, you know, all these things going on. We, you know, we've all, it's been a difficult time. And I, I was hosting an event last week about the, the human hungers and all the things we're actually missing around being, seeing people, that physical touch. It's not that we all are missing our commute, but we are missing the day to day engagement with people. And, you know, as a team, yes, as techies, we can all sit at home. We've all got our laptops. We were all on Google Hangouts anyway. We were all on Slack anyway. But it's still important that we get together and keep talking. I think people are more honest at the moment than ever. Yeah. And it's lovely to see people reaching out and saying, you can see when people are having a bit of a wobble and there's a lot of that been going on. And it's really lovely that people are doing that. There is a real sense of community. One thing I will say is when I launched the Techies three years ago, I stood up at the, the first one to launch it. And I said, guys, a lot of you in the room might see one another as competition. But actually, I think quite a few of you are very different and you actually have complementary skills that you might be able to pitch together to win a project. And I think now is time that just chat. You never know. Yes, you might compete and, and uh, you'll go your separate ways. That's fine. But you've had the chat and you never know what could, can happen from that. So talk to one another. Yeah, but even if you are competing, if you're comp if two of you are competing and there's a hundred in the population and you talk together and you both rise up, what's the problem? You've both risen up above the other hundred. Mm. Exactly. Power of collaboration. Exactly. Oh, right. Shall we give this networking thing Let's a go. go? Thank you all very much for your time. So if the people in the chat, I might see you in a room in a minute, but thank you very much to, to John and Greg for joining us and for Anita for, for being uh, a most wonderful hostess and uh, thank you, Lucy. logistics <laughs> woman. And we, do you know what? We'll do this again, I think. This has been good fun. Yeah. So, that right, I'm going to stop broadcasting. So we've got networking in the sessions. Let's go and see how that goes. And I shall hopefully see you all in a minute. Thank you. How do we move